Shadow of the Erd Tree has easily been one of the most ambitious, yet controversial products released by From Software. Lots of fans are fully satisfied with Elden Ring's new DLC, claiming that it's possibly the best piece of Souls content ever made, while others strongly argue that FromSoft's formula has started to show major cracks in their design, leading to an underwhelming expansion. At this point, it feels like the only thing that we can all unanimously agree on when it comes to Shadow of the Erd Tree is that Egon is a Chad. But aside from him, the community seems to be pretty damn split on virtually every aspect of this DLC. Naturally, when you've got a game that tries to balance so many different factors, such as trying to make the bosses difficult while still fun, providing a humongous variety of combat options while attempting to not make the game seem too easily breakable, having a consistently cool looking map that also feels satisfying to explore, and all the while making an effort to have compelling enough lore to stand on its own while feeling like it's a big enough elaboration on the base game story, there's no way that every player will feel satisfied with every design choice. And now it's time for my take on it. Which aspects I think it nailed, which ones could have used some work, as well as how it complements the base game. In a way, this is sort of like a part 2 to my Elden Ring pre-DLC review, which I will reference a little bit here and there, but it's definitely not required to watch in order to understand this one. So with that said, let's begin by discussing the Land of Shadow as a whole. While there's been a fair amount of debate over the quality of this DLC's world design, I think one of the few aspects that most would agree on is that it looks amazing. Like I've said before, I think all of the FromSoft games deserve plenty of recognition in their own right when it comes to aesthetics. But I firmly believe that Elden Ring has the best looking world they've ever created. From the wide landscapes full of varying colors to the intricately designed architecture found within the levels. I feel like this game is where they really found the perfect balance of being able to provide a massive variety of different types of locations, while also making almost all of them look visually awesome on their own. Obviously, the variety here isn't as impressive as the base game, since it just doesn't have as much to work with but it still easily lives up to the super high standards set by it. Now, let's talk more about how the world itself is set up. There are admittedly a few gripes I have with it, but overall... It's quite cool. When comparing it to the base game's world, it feels like they took a similar approach but put in significantly more effort in terms of making the ways that different regions connect to each other actually interesting and engaging to find. Most of the time you discover a new region, it's not because you just beat the current section and moved on to the next one. It usually involves you hanging out in some seemingly low-key area, thinking you might have found an entrance to a cave or whatever, and- Holy shit, what is this? It almost seems like they said, yo, what if we took Elden Ring's open world approach, but made it more like Dark Souls 1 where the layout is super vertical and tightly put together? Of course, the base game is still a lot more intricately designed than most open worlds, with all the underground sections and the unique methods of getting from one region to the next, but they unquestionably took that a huge step further in the Land of Shadow, making this one of the most satisfying pieces of content they've developed in terms of rewarding curiosity players by finding huge, completely missable areas in the most obscure possible places. Though, if I'm being completely honest, I gotta admit that this whole style of hiding secret areas can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, the fact that the entire southern third of the map is completely optional is super cool, since you can easily stumble upon a massive new section while exploring, which gives you an awesome feeling that you were able to find something a lot of players won't. But at the same time, if you don't happen to find them on your own, it can be a little frustrating. Personally, on my first playthrough of the DLC, despite my efforts to try and explore a fair amount, I ended up reaching the final boss fight after only defeating four Remembrance bosses. And once I realized that this seemed to be the end game, I figured that I clearly needed to do some more exploring before fighting him. So after some more failed attempts at trying to find the optional sections on my own, I ended up biting the bullet and 
just looked up how to make it to the map's southern regions, which I did have a pretty fun time in once I got to them, but I also felt like I had missed out a bit on the fun that comes from actually discovering them myself. Overall, this isn't a huge issue, and the fact that FromSoft designs their games like this is not something I would want them to change. While I did have a few frustrations every now and then, there were still countless moments in this DLC where I got that peak feeling of finding obscure secrets all by myself. It's just that when you're someone like me who's determined to see everything the game has to offer, you do feel slightly punished at times for not being perceptive enough. But now, let's switch gears and talk about the obvious highlights in terms of level design, the Legacy Dungeons. This DLC has given us three new full-on FromSoft levels, being Bellarat, Shadowkeep, and Denirilim. Starting with Bellarat, I think this place is a pretty solid intro level. The whole area has a cool, unique look to it. Lore-wise, it's interesting to see the location that was demolished by Mesmer's army, and the level design does a good job of utilizing Elden Ring's new jump mechanic. Unfortunately, it is a bit smaller than I initially expected. If you really want to, you can just fly through this area like it's nothing, but there's still a lot of cool stuff to find when thoroughly exploring. I had plenty of fun moments of combat and discovery while traversing this place, and it works nicely as a teaser for a near a limb. However, up next we have what is easily this DLC's biggest highlight of level design, the Shadow Keep. This level is basically the equivalent of Ashina Castle from Sekiro or Cathedral Ward from Bloodborne, where its purpose is to be a massive, well-designed area in its own right, while also being the glue that attaches a ton of different areas to each other. I mean, it's connected to Shadow Altus, Ancient Ruins of Ra, another part of Shadow Altus, a river that leads you to the Abyssal Woods, the Shadow Tree Base, the Shaman Village, the Shadow View Place where you fight Gaius, and of course, at the end of it, you get to fight Mesmer, who gives you a key item that's required to progress to a near limb. Plus, even when you're just going through the area itself, there are so many different looping pathways and awesome moments of level design that make it an absolute pleasure to explore. The main path leading to Mesmer is filled with memorable sections, fun enemies to fight, cool NPC interactions, and a nice little nod to the research hall from Bloodborne. But if you make your way through Bonnie Village and past the Cathedral of Manus Metter, you'll find yourself in the area's church district, which can lead you above the main parts of it, atop the rafters, and all the way to Marika's home village. Or you can also drain the water in the church district and take the secret underground path to the Shadow Tree base. Overall, this place is unquestionably one of FromSoft's top tier levels. It looks cool and unique, it's got enjoyable combat encounters, the connecting pathways are fun to explore, and it's basically the core of the north section of the map. Then moving on to the final legacy dungeon, we have Inira Lim, and in my mind, the most standout aspect of this place is easily just the fantastic way it looks. I love how much intrigue there is to find it after getting blocked by the initial gate since the architecture just looks so damn cool. And once you finally make it, I'd say that it lives up to the hype. I think it's easily one of the best looking areas FromSoft has ever made. Just look at this shit. Who the hell comes up with this stuff? I know I'm sounding like a real glazer right now, but I only glaze stuff when I think it's worthy of it. And the dudes at FromSoft who come up with all these brilliantly put together locations deserve a whole crispy cream in their honor. Of course, it's also nice that the gameplay and level design are solid as well. While it does feel like it could have been a bit longer, there's such a plethora of cool optional exploration in the mix that I don't really mind. It's got plenty of hidden paths in plain sight that are satisfying to discover, with the obvious standout being the super long journey taking you all the way back to Bellarat where you get the Euporia. Plus, there are also fun enemies to fight. While the learning curve of the Horned Warrior enemies is admittedly pretty damn steep, leading a lot of players to just run past them and think they suck, I've found that when you actually take the time to learn their movesets, they're some of the most fun and satisfying foes in the game outside of boss fights. So as a whole, I think the new major areas of this DLC are pretty solid. 
good. I'd be lying if I said I didn't wish that there were one or two more, but the ones that we did get feel like worthy additions to the game. Bellarat isn't too crazy, but Shadowkeep is up there with the best of the best, and a near limb is such a feast for the eyes, while also having enough substance to stand pretty well on its own. Now, for those of you who watched my main game review, you might recall that one of the major things I was hoping for from this DLC was to put a larger emphasis on having lots of well-designed small levels. You know, stuff like the Shaded Castle or the Carrion Study Hall, which aren't as complex as full-on legacy dungeons, but are more engaging than just the basic open-world stuff. And I'd say that they actually did a pretty decent job with this. You've got some fun little areas like Castle Ensis, Stone Coffin Fisher, and Midger's Mance, which do a decent job of scratching that FromSoft level design itch in between getting to the actual highlight locations. The reason why I value this so much is because having these many distractions here and there significantly help the game from falling into the open world trap of just being a bunch of boring land. Because as much as I think the open sections of this game are beautiful, beautiful and fun to discover the first time around. For someone like me who replays these games to death, one of Elden Ring's biggest drawbacks in comparison to the others is that the open parts simply don't have as much value as the actual intricately designed portions. And if I'm being honest, while these little areas that I just mentioned serve their purpose pretty well and keep you decently entertained every now and then, the open space problem does still rear its ugly head from time to time. In comparison to the base game, I'd say that there are definitely less instances in the realm of Shadow where I feel like I'm just horse riding for 8 minutes straight, but it definitely still could have been a little tighter. Take the Abyssal Woods for example. Upon first discovering this place, I thought it was awesome. The initial buildup when you first find it after the long journey descending through the catacombs and realize that Torrent is too frightened to even be summoned makes for one of the most atmospheric and intense introductions to any region in the game. And the unique enemies here that punish you for being caught in their vision is a cool gimmick that makes the gameplay feel sort of like a horror game. But after the initial cool factor of these woods wear off, what the hell even is there to do here? You get nothing! You lose! I mean, there's a couple of shadow tree fragments and some rats you can fight, I guess? After the first playthrough, this place basically just becomes a glorified sprinting to Midra's manse simulator. And the same idea definitely applies to plenty of other sections. The Cerulean Coast looks stunning visually, and does eventually lead to a boss fight that I really enjoy, but once again, there's not much to find here aside from countless spirit ash upgrades. You could also mention the finger ruins, which seem really pointless if you aren't aware of how they progress Ymir's questline, as well as the jagged peak, which is sort of like a glorified journey in order to reach Bale, though talking with Egon along the way definitely spices things up. And I know some people really hate the ancient ruins, but I actually enjoy going through them. When looking at a lot of these examples, one common theme you'll probably notice is that they often boil down to being a visually cool journey with not much to do that eventually leads to your reward being a boss fight. But if you happen to be someone who doesn't like the DLC's new bosses, and I know there are a lot of people who don't, then it just makes the whole journey feel kind of pointless and empty aside from the visuals. Personally, as someone who mostly loves the new fights, which we'll obviously talk more about later, it doesn't leave as sour of a taste in my mouth since I can treat these situations as just being glorified paths to the big combat encounters that basically make the game for me. But for those who don't get as much out of the bosses, I understand the limp energy that can come from it. Something else that also highlights this issue in my opinion is the misleading intrigue of the map. Remember back when most of the fanbase was wrapping up the main game, and there started to be a ton of complaints about how the size of the mountaintops of the giants on paper made the actual amount of content in it seem really disappointing? Well, I'd say that that definitely happens here a fair amount of times. Jagged Peak looks like it could have been a massive region with a legacy dungeon inside of it, but it's ultimately just a relatively brief hike to the top. And the big one for me was easily the Marika Village Finger Ruins section behind the shadow keep. I mean, come on, this looked like it would be such a cool and important area. And while it is important lore-wise, in terms of gameplay, it's literally just a tree sentinel duo, a falling star beast, pesky finger ruin enemies, and you blow a horn. That's it.
However, one aspect of this DLC that I feel like I never see anyone talk about, which personally caught me by surprise, was the improved quality of the caves. Now, I'm not trying to argue that these have a monstrous impact on the game's world or anything, but you know what? I'm actually pretty happy with the upgrades that FromSoft gave them. After exploring a fair amount of the caves in the base game, I think most people would agree that they're usually just not worth it with their often dull layouts, which almost always lead to a mini-boss that you've already fought somewhere else. Hey! Hey, I've seen this one! But from what I've experienced, I'm pretty sure every single cave in the Realm of Shadow has a unique fight at the end. Obviously, some of them are not the most engaging, but there are a few that I actually feel like going out of my way to fight on replay. Also, the level design of the caves themselves is generally way cooler. Not all of them are home runs, but a lot of them come with cool level design gimmicks and exploration that genuinely make them stand out as some of the more fun moments I've experienced in this expansion. Similarly to the small areas, I think they serve their purpose well for offering fun and engaging level design to keep you occupied in between finding the actual big levels. So by this point, I think I've made it clear through all of my yapping that there's a lot I like about the Realm of Shadow, along with a few nitpicks. The biggest pros are the quality of the legacy dungeons, the top tier aesthetic of everything, the more engaging and layered world design, and the plethora of small sections to explore like mini areas and caves. While the biggest cons would be the same open space issue of the base game, and just the general feeling at times that there could have been more meaningful content around certain corners. I know I've been doing a lot of complaining in this segment, but in reality, my feelings towards the world are mostly positive. Honestly, I do hope that in the future, FromSoft will go back to the more streamlined and organically connected philosophy of their previous games, but I've still had an awesome time experiencing the high highs that their open world provides especially on the first playthrough. Even if the traversal time between noteworthy locations can occasionally drag on a little too long, there's just so much great content to have fun with that it's hard for me to not see it as a mostly positive experience. Now, before moving on, I feel like I should touch on the Shadow Tree Fragment system and the NPC quests. Starting with the fragments, this system in particular seems to be a highly debated subject amongst the community, but in all honesty, I don't have a very strong opinion on it. I think the concept is a great idea. Naturally, by this point in the game, simply leveling up doesn't have as much impact as it did earlier on. So it feels good to find items that will actually make significant feeling improvements while encouraging you to explore. Though I do agree with the sentiment that some of the locations are a bit too obscure, and there definitely should have been more fragments than the exact amount you need to fully level it up. But after an update that they quickly released, there's just so little difference in the damage between levels 16 to 20 that finding every single fragment doesn't feel mandatory anyway. So all in all, I think this system was a positive addition. When it comes to the NPC quests, I feel pretty much exactly the same with them as I did in the base game. The lineup of characters themselves is really solid, with the biggest standouts in my opinion being Egon and based Ansbach. It was you, wasn't it? who defeated Lord Moog. Uh, fear not. I bear no grudge against you. But as I've said before, as time goes on, I'm becoming less and less of a fan of how FromSoft handles their quests. In previous games, I think they were reasonable enough to figure out on your own, but when traversing through the gargantuan world of Elden Ring, I had absolutely no luck progressing the quests by myself. And I think I was pretty damn thorough too. I actually made it a huge point to try and find characters and talk to them whenever possible, but by the end of my first playthrough, I had barely made any progress through their quests. I know that if I really wanted to, I could have just looked up guides for finishing them, and I have now, obviously, since I still wanted to see the quests for myself on subsequent playthroughs. But when trying to organically make your way through them on your own, I honestly think it's a little too tedious at times. Though I will say, the followers gank fight near the end is a really cool way of wrapping things up with the characters, especially if you finish the quests which allow you to have some of them as allies on your side. Alright, now that the most prominent aspect of the DLC is out of the way, let's talk more about combat. 
As I've said many times now on this channel, my favorite aspect of Elden Ring, and the main factor which I think gives it an edge amongst the other Souls games, is its build variety. While I think Sekiro and Bloodborne are able to reach higher highs with the fun of their combat systems, the sheer variety of cool stuff to use in this game makes for such an enjoyable sandbox of shit to mess around with. And thankfully, the new additions to the build variety seems to have clearly been one of the main appeals of this expansion. For whatever reason, at launch especially, a lot of the new stuff was really weirdly underpowered, but I have a strong feeling that within a few months there will be a lot more buffs to come. Especially after patch 1.13, which made a lot of the spells, well, actually usable. Seriously, I still have no idea what the hell they were smoking when they initially released this stuff. Starting with the weapons, while the base game already had more than 300 to choose from, this DLC has now brought that number over 400 while also introducing 8 new unique classes. All in all, I'm pretty satisfied with what we were given. I think the light great swords and great katanas are without a doubt the most solid of the new classes. They both don't have a single bad option to choose from. They're equipped with absolutely peak movesets, and the ones with unique skills tend to be pretty damn good, or at at least decently viable while looking really cool. Man, I'm so glad that I'm finally using cleaner footage to make up for the kinda blurry Rolana's Twin Blades flame skill in my last video. The hand-to-hand -hand weapon class is a personal favorite of mine, coming with insanely fun movesets that literally turn your character into a martial arts master. The reverse hand swords also have great movesets along with some peak ashes of war. The thrusting shields have added a whole new viable method of fighting to the game. The beast claws are really solid and fun to use. The perfume bottles, while definitely less relevant after Rolling Sparks got nerfed, are still good enough and super fun while looking awesome. The throwing weapons are admittedly not that crazy as a whole, but messing around with them can still be fun. I've also gotta say that they really went all out when it comes to the new skills in Ashes of War. Naturally, some are less viable than others, but there are undeniably an abundance of them that are super useful, look amazing, and are just a blast to use. Also, can't even lie, I'm a little salty that patch 1.13 came out like a day before I released my DLC weapons video. If I had made it afterward, then the Euporia would have easily made the list. That thing is now one of the most insane weapons they've ever cooked up. Now, when it comes to the new spells, the performance of a lot of them is admittedly very underwhelming, but one aspect I don't think anyone would deny is that a lot of them look really damn cool. Yep, this is without a doubt my favorite FromSoft game to do a pure spellcaster build on. Well, it already was before the DLC, but now it's even more solidified. I can't get over how fun it is to use all of these visually peak attacks. Some of my personal favorites they've added are Bale's Flame Lightning, Mesmer's Orb, Fire Serpent, Knight's Lightning Spear, Fleeting Microcosm, Gravitational Missile, Pest Thread Spears, Rotten Butterflies, Rain of fire, which is actually usable now, I still can't believe it and more. As usual, the incantations were given a lot more options than the sorceries, but also come with an abundance of ones that are just shittier versions of already existing spells. I mean, there are so many good ones to the point that this doesn't really matter, but it still feels weird that they would choose to waste time creating spells that don't serve any purpose. Anyway, by this point, I think it's pretty undeniable that Elden Ring is one of the best games on the market for someone who really wants to feel like a wizard or mage type dude and get to use 
use a plethora of awesome spells. Seriously though, we're on the right track to getting them properly balanced, but please FromSoft, just buff more of them. I feel bad for Rusty, he's already seemingly going insane after ranking so much stuff, and now he has to try and muster up the most niche possible uses for these underwhelming spells. Another aspect which honestly isn't that major, but still feels worth mentioning is some of the new projectile items you can use. Most of them aren't good enough to genuinely make a build around, but some stuff like the perfumed oil of Rana is actually pretty damn solid. Same goes for the throwing pots. While going out of your way to craft them is obviously a lot less convenient than just using a projectile spell or skill from a weapon, they're still pretty fun and commendable in their own right. There have also been a lot of new talismans and crystal tiers added to the game, some of which I actually use a lot now, like the FP regening talisman and the two-handed one. But of course, there's one crystal tier in particular that's genuinely a huge game changer for Elden Ring. That being the Deflecting Hard tier. Are you a fan of Sekiro's combat system? Well, good news, because now Elden Ring has a new tool where if you block attacks at the perfect moment, you take zero damage, reduced stamina damage, and best of all, it allows you to stack up to four deflections, which each increase the damage of your guard counters by 20%. I don't think I need to explain just how much this changes things. It's basically added a whole new style of approaching bosses where you don't have to dodge if you don't feel like it. Even with her health stealing ability, fighting Melania with this active feels so smooth. The only downside is that it's a crystal tier and not a talisman, meaning the effect is temporary, but still, 5 minutes is a pretty solid chunk of time, so I'll take what I can get. Overall, the additions to the build variety in Shadow of the Erd Tree have definitely lived up to my expectations. There are some nitpicks you could make here or there, but as a whole, there's such a vast amount of cool new shit to play with to the point that I rarely even use the main game weapons after making it to the DLC. And with so many unique weapon skills, ashes of war, and items that can vastly change how you play the game, I really can't blame anyone for saying that Elden Ring has their favorite combat in the series. Bloodborne and Sekiro still get the edge for me, but this game undeniably has so much going for it. Plus, you can even make it like a pseudo Bloodborne using the blind spot Ash of War, or pseudo Sekiro with the deflecting hard tier. While I'm always going to have a few nitpicks with Elden Ring as a whole, such as long travel time between locations, the allure of being able to try out and experiment with new weapons and spells is going to keep me coming back for a long time. Well, similarly to my previous review of the game, I think this segment is unavoidably going to be the most controversial part of the video. Discussing bosses in Elden Ring is like walking on some really thin ice in which countless players are ready to bash them for being too demanding, while others would argue that this game is the pinnacle of FromSoft's boss design. But before really getting into the meat and potatoes of the big fights, let's talk more about enemies and mini-bosses. When it comes to enemies, I'd say that they're pretty good, but usually feel really hit or miss. One common trend with a lot of the most formidable ones is that they have really, really tough learning curves. Like so much so to the point that I'm sure there are a lot of players who just straight up hate them and never want to fight them again. Now, for a souls fiend such as myself who goes out of their way to learn the movesets of every single enemy in some of their games so that I can dissect and make full on rankings of them, I'm able to appreciate how complex a lot of them are. In particular, the Bellarat Knights are super satisfying once you learn their timing, and the further evolution of them, being the Horned Warriors in a near limb, are debatably some of the best enemies they've ever designed. Their movesets are complex and fun to keep up with, plus they get the benefit of coming with some great spectacle from their attacks, not including the Ice Guy though, I don't like him. But for the majority of players, I know that there's only so much time they're willing to spend on fighting a single enemy when there's obviously the much easier option of just running right past them. If I had to bet on it, I'd say that at least 60% of the people who bought this DLC didn't bother learning how to fight the Curse Blade dudes. I've seen nothing but pure, intense hatred for those guys online. But luckily, there are also plenty of mid-difficulty enemies that I think make for some decently engaging combat for the average player. You've got the Black Knights, the Fire Knights, the goofy big boys who bounce around, the Scorpion 
Guardian Spiders, and that one Centaur -a Crucible Knight. Some of the lowly foes like Mesmer Soldiers are also pretty solid, especially since they have a few moves that come with a shit ton of hyper armor, which forces you to actually respect them every now and then. However, there are also a fair amount of lowly enemies, and just needlessly annoying ones that honestly kinda suck. The low health pitch dark dudes get old very quickly, and don't really add anything since they die in one hit. The ghost flame birds are actually kinda cool in my opinion, but also suck to fight in groups. The giant flies are just sorta uncool and aren't noteworthy, and those damn finger ruin enemies can go jump off a cliff. I hate that projectile grab. So all in all, some are cool, some suck, and some are just meh, but I would say that as a whole, they did a fair job with the new enemies. When it comes to the mini bosses, unfortunately I'm a little less impressed. When discussing enemies, I feel like the fact that you find a lot of the ones from the base game here isn't too big of a deal since that's already been the case in some of the previous FromSoft DLCs. And I'd say most people don't expect as much from the enemies as they do the mini bosses, which is why I have a much lower tolerance for seeing familiar faces when it is the mini bosses. I think some instances of it are kinda reasonable and feel fitting, such as the two tree sentinels guarding Marika's village, and the ghost flame dragons, which actually have a few unique moves when compared to the basic dragon template. But man, more ulcerated tree spirits, another lanciax, another falling star beast, regular enemies passing off as bosses, and even a shitty reuse of one of the DLC's main fights? Bruh. While I would say that this DLC generally doesn't fall into the repeat boss fights issue as much as the main game does, it is still present. At the end of the day, it isn't a massive problem, especially since some of them, like the Falling Star Beast, I actually really enjoy fighting in a vacuum, but it does give off a slight vibe of laziness. Though there are still a few solid new ones, the Death Knights are awesome. They come with cool designs and fun movesets that are somewhat complex and feel satisfying to learn. Regalia the Bear and the Golden Hippo are also pretty good in my opinion, but not gonna lie, most of the other ones aren't too special, and for whatever reason, there's also a shit ton of NPC fights in this expansion. I don't know if I'd necessarily call that a bad thing, since one-on-one -on -one NPC battles are usually kinda just inoffensive, but they definitely don't feel like super positive additions to the mini-boss lineup. Also, I don't know if we're considering these guys as enemies or mini-bosses, but the Furnace Golems, while visually cool, honestly kinda suck to fight. It's just too repetitive and drawn out. So I would have to say that I'm kinda disappointed with the mini-bosses of the DLC. However, next we finally get to talk about the major bosses, which seem to be the most polarizing aspect of this expansion. If I'm being real, the main boss lineup is easily one of my favorite things about Shadow of the Erd Tree. When it when it comes to this subject, I know there's a certain elephant in the room that quickly comes to mind, but I'm gonna save him for later. Ever since the main game of Elden Ring dropped, there's been a ton of controversy surrounding the idea that FromSoft's new boss design philosophy is too demanding and over the top leaving very short openings in between their combos, which force the players to put in more effort in terms of spacing and finding windows to attack within their combos as opposed to after them. While I do think that this style is a little harder for newcomers to get used to, as someone who's fully willing to learn the fights despite dying a fair amount of times, I honestly can't get enough of them. I admit that some do have noteworthy flaws here and there, such as the annoying camera and the divine beast fight, Metter's laser attack, which is only avoidable by perfectly running away or using niche skills, Gaius's charge being a little too punishing when you're still learning it, and Radon's absolutely terrible triple sword swing combo which is damn near unavoidable without using niche tactics. But aside from the occasional blemishes such as these, I think most of the hate that these fights get are not deserved whatsoever. If FromSoft's new style of movesets aren't for you, then I totally understand that. Not everyone is willing to treat these games nearly like a part-time job in order to properly learn them. But I feel like too many people are getting way ahead of themselves trying to justify their frustrations by arguing that it's due to terrible and unreasonable design, when most of the time that's clearly not the case. It's such a shame that there's been so much discourse surrounding them, because I believe that the majority of these new fights are purely positive additions to the game's boss lineup. 
I think this image sums up the issue perfectly. Plus, Rolana, Midra, Bale, and Mesmer in particular are now some of my favorite fights in the series. Rolana has one of the most perfectly polished movesets they've ever made. She has such a wide variety of different ways that she can follow up certain attacks and combos to the point that you can rarely predict what her next move will be, giving her some of the best replay value in the series. Midra was an unexpectedly awesome battle with an amazing design and a super smooth and fun moveset. He is a little on the easier side when it comes to the top tier fights, but it's still really enjoyable regardless, and I love that you can crouch under his floaty spin moves. Bale is in my opinion, the new best dragon fight they've ever made. It's like they combined the top tier spectacle of Placidusax's fight with the polished moveset of Medir, making for one of the most well-rounded, rewarding bosses they've ever cooked up. And Mesmer is just the most perfect all-around package. He looks cool, his lore is tragic and interesting, his voice acting is memorable as hell, his flaming attacks are some of the best looking ones in the game, and his moveset is basically flawless. He's got a great variety of different combos and follow-ups, as well as just some peak standalone attacks like this one, which is easily one of my favorite moves to dodge in any of the FromSoft games. I had some pretty damn high expectations for the quality quality of these main fights, and all in all, I'd say that they delivered. The top four are some of the best in the series, and I wouldn't say there were any Remembrance fights that I overall disliked. I know a lot of people think Gaius is dog shit, but aside from the charge attack which has a pretty rough learning curve, I think he's a fun boss. Now I guess it's about time we talk about the big point of discussion, Radon, Consort of Mikola. Possibly the most controversial video game boss ever made. I never imagined imagined that something would surpass Melania in that regard, but here we are. Lots of people consider him to be one of FromSoft's greatest achievements, while way, way more people seem to think that the fight is straight garbage. And while I personally lean on the side of liking him, I do understand why he's so controversial. There are a few bullshit aspects, such as that triple combo I mentioned earlier, and many seem to think his second phase is a visual mess that creates a massive visibility problem. But I think the main reason why the fight is so hated is not necessarily due to a few particular moves being unfair, but rather just how difficult he is as a whole. There are a lot of moves that I used to think were genuinely terrible on my first playthrough, but through lots of trial and error, I've realized that there are ways of getting around them. And I think when you combine so many different punishing aspects into one fight, such as the fact that all of his regular swings come with holy projectiles, this move, which isn't very intuitive, intuitive to learn, having barely any downtime for you to attack him, visual clutter in the second phase, some people apparently experiencing frame rate drops. Along with one genuinely bad move, there's an overwhelming amount of factors that pile up to the point that I can easily imagine the average player coming face to face with him and deciding that it's just not worth it. Like I said though, I am one of the many players who enjoys him. After learning his moveset, I think the fight can be a blast in terms of gameplay. Plus, the arena and setting are great, but the music might actually be my favorite part of it. I'm not very good at dissecting music since I don't know as much about it as some others, but I think it's without a doubt one of the most beautiful, godlike tracks they've ever made, and it fits so perfectly. It's a great send-off for the game's soundtrack. Now, one other factor that leads to people not liking this fight is the lore, but we're gonna talk more about that later. All in all, I'm a big fan of this DLC's main bosses. While I was hoping for them to possibly find new and innovative ways to structure them, it's not like I can really hold that against FromSoft, especially since some are already pushing the boundaries of the game's combat system. Also, I concede, the followers fight is really cool when you do all of the quest lines. I now fully understand why I pissed some people off in my DLC boss ranking. I still wouldn't call it top tier since the gameplay is just a bunch of NPCs, but it is very uniquely enjoyable. One genuine major complaint I do have though is this DLC's lack of cutscenes. Out of the 11 main bosses, only 4 of them have cutscenes, which is honestly really disappointing in some cases, with the biggest standout being 
being Rolana. She's an absolute badass who has ties to a major character of the base game, as well as one of the most prominent figures of the DLC. She even has cool lore about her loyalty to Mesmer, but the presentation of her fight is really basic. The cool factor of her actual attacks are great, but her arena is kinda just serviceable, and there's no proper build-up to it. She just happens to be the boss sitting at the end of a mini-castle. But aside from some gripes like this one, I think FromSoft did a solid job of going out with a bang in the form of Elden Ring's final major bouts. Not everyone sees eye to eye on them, but myself, along with many others, I've gotten a lot of enjoyment out of them. For those of you who've watched my base game review, you'll know that I'm a massive fan of Elden Ring's lore. The sheer amount of history, character motivations, and different factions spread throughout the lands between makes for what is, in my opinion, the second most compelling narrative FromSoft has put together until now. And before the release of Shadow of the Erd Tree, I was easily the most excited that I've ever been to discover new information about one of FromSoft's games. I actually became one of those dudes who reads a bunch of the item descriptions, including the description for every new boss remembrance. Naturally, I still had to watch people who specialize in this subject in order to really get a better understanding of things, but I still got a lot of enjoyment from learning by myself. And while I wouldn't say that everything was handled perfectly, for the most part I'm still immensely satisfied with the new revelations we've been given. First and foremost, one of my biggest hopes which I mentioned in the previous review was for us to learn more about Marika, and Thankfully, that was one of the main points this DLC has elaborated on. Where she was born, the terrible way that her people were treated, and her motivations for using Mesmer to purge the horn scent of Bellarat. At the end of the day, there are still some aspects which have been left to speculation, such as what events led to this moment at the Divine Gate. But with her past being such a major focus, I definitely can't complain. We still never learned why she likes to sleep on rocks though, said. Luckily, her son Mesmer is also an interesting character. Just like literally all of her other children, he was born cursed, in his case being with the Abyssal Serpent. And with the power of his epic flames, he was chosen by his scheming mom to become a symbol of fear for the Horn Scent, before she abandoned him in the Realm of Shadow, seemingly to never be known by anyone in the modern world of the Lands Between. That shit is so messed up, and it makes complete sense why, after endless years of staying loyal to her, when you finally defeat him, he decides that he's done with her bullshit. Marika, a curse upon me. But my favorite new story revelation given to us in this expansion is easily what we learn about the fingers. Big shout out to my duty Mir. This man spouts insanely important information about the world like every other sentence. Before the DLC came out, we knew that the Greater Will had abandoned the lands between, but the opening cutscene of the game heavily implied that this was because of the Elden Ring shattering. However, based on this line, Well, the truth lies deeper still. It is their mother who is damaged and unhinged. The fingers are but unripe children, victims in their own right. And this item description stating that once Metra was broken, she stopped getting messages from the Greater Will, it seems pretty clear that there's been zero guidance since way before the Shattering. Meaning every time since then that the Fingers have communicated with the Finger Maidens, it's basically all just been bullshit. This entire world is operating on hollow rules set by a god that hasn't even been in contact with it for countless years, and that's so wild to me. But now, let's discuss the DLC DLC's finale, involving Mikola and his promised consort. While I initially wasn't on board with this, after learning more and more about it, I do admit that it does at least make sense. The reason why Melania wanted to defeat Radon was to bring his soul to Mikola for his Age of Kindness, while using poor Moog's body as a vessel. Though ultimately, Mikola's other half, Saint Trina, confirms that by this point, Mikola's goal for an Age of Kindness simply isn't worth it, which is why you need to defeat him. As a whole, I do think all of this was well put together, but honestly, I still kinda don't feel too great about Radon being the final boss. I know a lot of people really wanted Godwin to have a hand in Mikola's shenanigans, and I'm sure that would've worked pretty well, but personally, I just would've liked it to be 
anyone who we haven't already faced as a boss. When I first made it to the final fight, I did think it was kind of cool to see Prime Radon, but I also got a slightly uneasy feeling that it could have been something more original. Also, I straight up hate the final cutscene. It doesn't provide us with any new information, it just shows what we already know, that Mikola wanted Radon as his consort. I know FromSoft often likes to leave the end of their DLCs as being somewhat ambiguous, however, they usually handle it significantly better. But overall, I do feel satisfied with the lore of the DLC. We learned of quite a few events which took place before Marika's reign, as well as the motivations of Mikola, who wanted to right the wrongs of his family's past. I wish that some aspects of the finale would have hit a little harder, and maybe given the game a slightly more proper feeling send-off, but when all's said and done, I had a great time learning more about this world. Prior to its release, this might have been the most anticipated video game DLC of all time. And while everyone's got their own takes, with some being more satisfied than others, I would personally say that it lived up to my expectations. It didn't surpass them, but it did meet them. Going into it, I already had the feeling that certain aspects, such as the unnecessarily large open spaces, were probably gonna show up, for better or worse. And while there were a few fun ideas that I hoped for, such as a boss gone, mode. All I really wanted was for it to be like the base game, but generally better. And I think that's exactly how it turned out. If you're a fan of Elden Ring's gameplay formula, then I don't see why you wouldn't enjoy it. It isn't some genius rework that completely changes how the game functions or whatever. I mean, there are a few aspects that feel like significant improvements, like the structure of the world. But at the end of the day, it's basically the same thing as all of the previous FromSoft DLCs. An extra chunk of content that's noticeably more consistent than the base game, while also having a few unexpected tricks up its sleeves, such as the deflecting hard tier. The biggest difference that sets this one apart from the previous expansions is the immense size of it. While I think it's arguable that some of their other DLCs get the edge in terms of being more consistently great throughout their whole runtime, this one easily has the largest amount of great content in it, making it feel more than worth the price tag if you ask me. Some people didn't like the main boss but honestly, I feel like there rarely isn't at least a bit of boss controversy whenever a new FromSoft product is released. Remember how much people used to despise Sister Frida and Medir? If I had to choose my biggest nitpick, it would be that the ending didn't feel as satisfying as some of their previous expansions, but the amount of fun I had throughout the journey leading to that conclusion still made it more than worth it. Though, I recently saw some dude mention the idea of how the Divine Gate would have been perfect as an entrance to a boss gauntlet mode, and now I can't get it out of my head. But still, the DLC naturally fixed my main issue with the base game, being that I thought it didn't have enough main boss fights. Having an extra 11 added on to what we already got has fulfilled my desire for getting more fun dudes with complex moves to fight. Plus, with all the super fun additions to the build variety, along with a lot of elaboration on the base game's lore, I feel like Shadow of the Erd Tree has managed to deliver on every front. But of course, that's just my opinion opinion, so feel free to tell me about your thoughts on the DLC in the comments. While there has been a fair share of annoying controversy, it's still been fun to see one of the FromSoft games blow up in relevance for a second time. As far as my next videos, I admit that there are a few ideas I want to fulfill which I know not all of you guys will be on board with. But since I just got myself a much better and more convenient video capturing setup, there are also a few big Souls related projects that I might finally get around to. Though I'm gonna be real with y'all, the Elden Ring enemy ranking is coming someday, but man, holy f shit, man. That one's gonna take a while. So just don't hold your breath. The Dark Souls 1 ranking is definitely gonna happen before it. Anyway, that's all I've got for now. Until next time.